So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to, you know, business as usual. I'm pretty excited about today. Uh, we have Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman of the state of Pennsylvania. I'm sort of psyched to talk to him. He's been making the rounds lately, being pretty famous around the United States, but we're proud to have him here. And uh, he is joining us as he's actually in the car on his way to Harrisburg. So we're excited to take a half hour of his time, listen to what his priorities are, and hopefully have a little bit of fun. So I want to give a shout out to Huntington Bank for their support. And I also want to give a shout out to AT&T. AT&T has um, been our public policy partner for quite a while. And we always try to leverage this format and partner with AT&T, but they have actually helped a lot during this pandemic and really addressing a lot of the issues around the digital divide and actually including tackling food insecurity. So deeply appreciative of both AT&T and Huntington Bank. So we've muted your mics. We've, if you've been on the show, you know we ask you not to sell your wares. We're here just to listen to our guest and have an opportunity to exchange, you know, some thoughts, have a quick chat, and see as much of a deep dive as we can with our guest today, like we do each and every day. Jonathan Kirsting is with us today, as always. He's Vice President of All Things Media and Marketing, and uh, he will keep his eye on the chat. And we're hoping for this, as you can imagine, to be lively, and it's pretty important. So I want to say thank you to everyone who's joined us today and has joined us each and every day. And now we're going to jump in. And we have Lieutenant Governor John. I mean, he tells me to call him John, but Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman. So John, how are you? Fantastic. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. It is great to be here. It's great to see you. First of all, how are you feeling? How are you holding up through all of this? Oh, you know, everything's everything's great. Uh, I don't have uh, any any issues or, you know, uh, there's so many folks with the resurgence of COVID and, and whatever. I, I've got no complaints. Uh, good, delighted, uh, glad that it's kind of coming to oh. an end. Uh, you know, all the drama and the election and everything. And, uh, you know, certainly looking forward to Thanksgiving and, and everything. So. so good. I'm glad you're safe and I'm, I'm glad you're doing well. So let, let's start by providing a yeah. general overview of the state of COVID in Pennsylvania and how the Commonwealth is responding sure. and some of your guidance. Well, the, the, the overall state with COVID is critical right now. I, I can't, think of another word to describe it. It's like we have record high caseloads. And the sense I get, and obviously this isn't scientific, but I, I think I, I pretty much uh, know uh, the way things are on the ground, is that I think many Pennsylvanians, if not most, are no longer, quote unquote, afraid of the virus, or they just assume it's out there and I'm going to live my life. I think that's a fair representation. I know the governor has always sought to strike the appropriate balance between lives and livelihood. And I know that, you know, he's not currently considering any drastic lockdowns or, or returning to anything that we may have saw back in March or April, but the caseloads are concerning. And the arguments that we continually have are dismaying that wearing a mask is somehow a political statement that saying, you know what, we're not going to have all these indoor gatherings. We are going to practice basic social distancing. We are not going to argue over basic medical hygiene and appropriate conduct during a pandemic. I don't understand that. And I think one of the great tragedies from this pandemic, other than the lives and the treasure that we've lost, is that we forgot that the virus is the enemy and you can't be more, you know, pro mask is as pro business as you can be. Pro social distancing is as pro business as you possibly can be. And we need each other. Nobody wants to see a business closed or certainly go under. It's simply a matter of, are we going to embrace these basic, very simple kinds of things and not make them about freedom or 
fascism or all the hyperbole you see online and just say, you know what, maybe you're not afraid of the virus, but maybe I am, or maybe I have someone in my life that that wouldn't fare so well with it. I mean, we all have somebody in our lives that probably shouldn't be be uh, taking a chance. So why not just wear that mask if you're going to get your coffee or you're going to get your groceries or you want to protect these frontline workers that don't have a choice. They, you know, I think of all of these grocery workers, for example, that, you know, the grocery store stayed open even when we didn't know what this was going to look like back mm -hmm. in April. And and they none of them were got getting rich, you know, no right. looked like then. So like just basic courtesy and respect and it has nothing to do with politics. So so but what do you think about Philadelphia? Philadelphia went on on a significant um, lockdown, yeah. right? Until January first. Sure. Yeah, I, I I mean they 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 know the conditions and the circumstances on the ground there and and I, I certainly you know, would, would not take issue with, with what they're doing. I mean, this idea that, that I would know better than what they have on the ground, I, I certainly would never advance that point. But, but what, one of the things this pandemic has demonstrated, uh, other than the need to just come, to come together and recognize this common enemy, is that, uh, you know, we have a significant budget deficit here in Pennsylvania as a result of all of this. So we, right. we need to look through new sources of revenue and, and one that, you know, I hope I get the chance to discuss with your, your members today is, is legal weed for Pennsylvania too. That, that, well, that's what I was just gonna yeah. ask you about. I was gonna say the budget deficit and you already led right into that. So let's yeah. just talk about that given the impact and the yeah, opportunity. Well, I mean, let's, let's, be, let's be honest here. Like uh, we're looking at multi billions of dollar of deficit and no one wants to raise taxes and no one wants to cut services. So we need to find new revenue sources. And legalizing marijuana in Pennsylvania would at a minimum, and no one really genuinely disputes this, is that's you're talking $5 billion in free money over a 20 year window, at least, you know, that's, uh, that's a conservative 250 a year, 10 years, two decades. And, you know, we're, you're seeing numbers generated like that in Colorado and other states, even states where we have much more population than, than they do. And then when you factor in the jobs, I mean, like who doesn't need tens of thousands of new jobs that appeal to tech-centered, younger people, those, those that really want to stay in Pennsylvania and you have an opportunity to create a brand new industry. And then when you talk about that there's 20,000 on average Pennsylvanians that are arrested and charged for marijuana in Pennsylvania every year that are introduced to the criminal justice system for just consuming a plant, let's be honest here. And the you have the hundreds of thousands over the years that have accrued that have this mark on their record that stops them from participating more, getting a better job, getting uh, going to school, I mean, whatever it is. Like, why, why? Like, who's better off with prohibition? And then when you factor in our veterans are constantly telling me that we need cannabis to, to feel normal, not, not to feel great, but just to feel normal again. And when you mm -hmm. talk about the, the, the racial disparities on the enforcement, I mean, it's, right. it's, it's a no brainer. I, the only grounds that a, a, a prohibitionist can argue on now is vestigial reefer madness. And now, you know, you can argue who won in 2020 on the ballot, but the biggest winner was weed. States as conservative as South Dakota voted to legalize it. And I, I think that if you're to the right of anything of South Dakota, you need to just kind of reevaluate, you know, your, your views and say, yeah, well, you know, if, if South Dakota can go there, maybe Pennsylvania really should be taking a look at that. And I've been saying this now for as long as I can remember. It's not political. It's bipartisan. It's a solution for a problem that we've had before the pandemic. Now that we're in multi-billion dollar deficit, how can you say no to five billion in long-term money for just simply saying yes to a, a plant? So what do you think though? What do you think like in terms of your vision? What's the vision on how this can be done? And in what ways 
does this support equity and and job creation and safety? Oh my and gosh. then we're going to get to some questions. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It, it, it's it's all of that, and it's not my vision. It's just a simple reality here in Harrisburg. But for a, key, a few key leadership positions on the GOP, if they just say we're going to have this conversation, and then everyone gets to participate in that, and they can figure out what legal weed in Pennsylvania looks like. And it would have to be a collaboration between the two parties because mm -hmm. that's how things work in Harrisburg. And we would also have to acknowledge that it's not a, that you, we're, we're turning our backs on reefer madness. We're turning our backs on prohibition for any number of reasons. And just because a substance is legal does not mean that you love it, you wanna use it, mm -hmm. or that we are advocating that teenagers should use it or any of these things. The truth is we have a thriving weed market in Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, it's the black market. And unfortunately we have zero purity standards. We aren't collecting any revenues, but the cartels sure are. Mm -hmm. We are experiencing violence as a result of its black market status. We are empowering dealers of this substance who often typically sell actually dangerous drugs and much more addictive drugs that we don't know what's in the, the marijuana, where it was grown and all these other things. So it, it actually is, would dramatically increase safety, revenue, jobs, justice for our farmers. And also in Pennsylvania, 40% of our population is going to be basically a, a drive to the grocery store from a veritable candy land of legal weed in New Jersey, because that's another state that just voted to legalize it. So right. you're going to have these enormous, and, and, and just announced yesterday, Virginia is also announced that right. they are now going to legalize. And I'm in New York, it's inevitable. So how many of these border states are we going to give our money, our jobs, our justice, our freedom to, instead of saying, you know what? Why aren't we leaders on this instead of, of taking a chance on falling way behind when we don't need to? All right. I, I agree with you. I'm watching it. When I saw Virginia, I couldn't believe it. I said, there, there we go. So let's just, I'm going to, there's a ton of questions, John. So I want to get sure. to some of them and Jonathan's going to pick some out. I know there's a ton of them. So thanks for your time. My pleasure. Jonathan, you want to start? You're on mute. Okay. Jonathan's on mute. So I will dig into the chat here. There we go. I'm back in black right here. Right. There you go. Keep going, Jonathan. Thank you, Governor, for being good, Lieutenant Governor, for being part of this conversation today. Lots of great questions here. Um, there's a, a, a couple of both Michael Nilo and Will Allen are curious, like, how can you make sure that uh, there's incentives uh, to, to make sure that 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 there is um, some equality when it comes to starting up uh, legal marijuana operations? Because sure. it's capital intensive, making sure that people of color have opportunity to participate in this as well, too. Of course. Of course, that's a great question. And and I, and I would just, uh, I, in fact, I hosted a conference between my two colleagues and friends, the Lieutenant Governors of Illinois and Michigan, who are, are both uh, really committed to this. And those are both states that have legal weed. And Ill Illinois, it has the distinction of doing it legislatively. Mm. And that is a fabulous, that's like the gold standard as far as I'm concerned. And, and both my colleagues are black and both of them have a very sensitive uh, kind of awareness of the issues uh, uh, that question that brings up and and they are experts on it so I would I would uh, uh, hold them out as as great resources too to anyone in Pennsylvania that they are uh, expressed a, a more than willingness to, to 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 have that conversation quite frankly uh, and it's it's undeniable the war on drugs and the prohibition of cannabis has dramatically disproportionately impacted people and communities of color and the legalization should benefit accordingly uh, as well too. I know that is an issue that is near and dear to advocates for this here in Pennsylvania, but I would always just you know remind individuals that the perfect cannabis bill is your bill, not necessarily the one that positions that would weigh in that may not feel as intensely as you do. Uh, so we have to get to the point where leadership in Harrisburg on the Republican side stops even denying that this is not a good thing. And then it, we could be fine tune it with those kind of critical issues uh, as part of the conversation. 
Well, so you he, actually, can I just say one thing? So, and then Jonathan, go, you actually went around to 67 counties, I believe. Correct. Married people. Yeah, every, so, every oh, last one. Right. Yeah. So, you, know, you know what's funny? It, I went around to every one of them. And after we compiled the report, it was the most interactive public policy topic in Pennsylvania's history. And that's, that's a fact. And I estimated that support for marijuana in Pennsylvania is somewhere around 65% but no, no higher than 70, so mid to upper 60s. And then, and then just two weeks ago, if that, a national study came out and they said 68% of Americans, 68% support legal weed. And you know, Republicans accused me of lying or inflating the numbers. And, and literally I was right on the mark, you know, like down, you know, down to almost the exact percent. And that's the truth, it's bipartisan. I want everyone to understand Prohibition of weed is a minority viewpoint in Pennsylvania, a very small minority viewpoint. And we cannot have the tyranny of the minority in Pennsylvania denying our commonwealth, the revenue, the jobs, the justice, the, 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 the treatment for veterans, for our farmers, you name it. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So uh, do you think the legalization of marijuana might eventually lead to further opening of retail wine, spirits and alcohol sales? I, I do. I, I, think, I, I, I think Pennsylvanians have a good understanding of the, the benefits of structural limitations on availability. In other words, checking ID and making sure that it doesn't fall in the hands of those young people or people that it shouldn't. And I think that's one of the upsides of legalizing marijuana is, is that it goes from some dude on the corner or your dealer to uh, a trusted professional that will make sure that it, you know, ask any teenager as I, I do when I was on my 67 county tour, what's harder to get a bottle of Jack or, or a bag of weed and not once, not one <laughs> ever said that it, it was uh, Jack it is much, you know, I, he's like, I could get weed in 15 minutes. It goes right to Emily Mercurio's uh, point. Um, first of all, she wants to thank you and yourself personally for normalizing this medicine for use in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, she wants to know upon recreational legalization, how will we ensure the same level of care and knowledge of products that she's currently seeing in, in uh, dispensaries right now? Yeah, aren't the dispensaries amazing? It's like, it's like the Apple, Apple store meets weed, you know, in terms of like knowledgeable, friendly products and, and and it's amazing when people experience it for the first time. And, and across Pennsylvania, people were like, wow, that's amazing. Like they thought it was some dirty head shop and, <laughs> and it's like, oh, it's kind of whatever. And they walk in, they're like, oh my gosh, this isn't what I thought at all. And, and, and that really won the hearts and minds of people. And your, your, your client is actually grandma or someone that you wouldn't think. It's not Cheech and Chong, it's not Reefer Madness. It's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I can use a plant to improve the quality of my life that I could technically grow next to my tomatoes. And it's not this insidious schedule one drug that it is uh, you know, listed. It's outrageous, outrageous. And um, I can guarantee that recreational would have that same space that you've, I've been in legal marijuana shops in other states and it's no different. There's not it's not crazy the world didn't spin off its axis in colorado or washington or these other states it's like oh yeah there's a weed store or oh yeah you know it's just it it's normal it's part of the landscape um and and uh it just doesn't make any sense not to it really doesn't in fact it's actually quite harmful to continue down this path of prohibition because again twenty thousand criminal records every year it's mm -hmm. veterans that are forced to either choose between the something that they need or uh, or being labeled a quote unquote criminal by by, by using a, a cannabis illegally it, it's it just doesn't need to be this way so what about at the federal level what are the prospects of dealing with this at the federal level because... uh, i don't know it's unknown uh, i i pushed the biden uh, campaign to uh, and i said this during the uh, you know back in september i said if one or one or the other can campaign aggressively legalized marijuana, whether it was the president or Biden, um, they would have they would have won the, the election. And I think that's been borne out. You know, it, it's like 
Trump lost by a few hundred thousand votes spread over five or six states. You're telling me, you know, in fact, I called it the bazooka of legal weed. Everybody wants this. I don't care. I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat. It, it, cu it cuts across party lines. It cuts across um, uh, economics. It, it, it's just it just makes sense. And and I, I would hope that the vice president, uh, uh, the president elect would do everything within his power to take it off schedule one and work towards legal weed. Uh, and, and that's where we need to, but we don't have to wait for them in Pennsylvania. And we need to get uh, uh, these uh, members of the GOP legislature who literally have no excuse left. When, when conservative states like Montana and South Dakota mm -hmm. and Arizona are like, yeah, we're doing this, why are we why are we arguing about this you know mm -hmm. jonathan there's some more questions you want to grab them yeah, actually on, on the heels of that matt berlando has a great question here on what's know given how challenging and limited the availability is to financing for uh, cannabis operators does pa have any plans to incentivize traditional state charters or financial institutions to provide easier yeah. access to liquidity yeah they, they, they do the governor speaks about that uh, often but again, you're going to have a supernova of innovation and 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 uh, alignment once it's taken off schedule one. I mean, that's that's what's that's critical, because right now, according to the federal government, cannabis is as dangerous as crack heroin and right. uh, some of these other highly, you know, like so that's that's what creates this weird like even in Nantucket, they actually have to do everything on the island because you know what, if you put it on a boat and crossed that's technically violating federal law because marijuana is schedule one. I mean, that's how insane that is in Massachusetts. So um, it's, it's reefer madness. It's, that's all it is. It's vestigial reefer madness and it needs to end and it's going to create billions in revenue. It's going to create hundreds of thousands of jobs or more nationally. Uh, it's, it just needs to happen. And, and, I, and Pennsylvania could, still could be a leader it still could be a leader. And, and I would just hope that, you know, given all the challenges that we faced, we would say, you know what, South Dakota went there. Why the hell wouldn't we want to in Pennsylvania? Mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's a question out there about investors. So there, we have a couple of people who are on the show that are talking about investors. Are they, mo and they're investors in the, in the, the cannabis industry. Are there any um, models that Pennsylvania is going after in terms of thinking about this? Well, I, as I mentioned earlier, Illinois to me is the gold standard of, of, of that in terms of that balances economics, equity, and access uh, across the board. And I, I would just urge everybody patience in that First, we have to break the, the, the log jam. You know, we have re really just a matter of two or three individuals that, would, that are holding this up. And we need to reach them and say, you know what? Why not have a conversation about this? Why not just realize that this is a, a great public good? Doesn't mean you have to love it. Doesn't mean that you want to. You know, and, you know, and then some people will say, well, you want your kids using weed? I'm like, no, I don't. I don't want them smoking uh, Marlboros. I don't want them drinking Jack Daniels either. But that it, it doesn't mean that those substances should then be illegal. It means that we are we live in a free society, and I have that libertarian side. Where why would the government have the right to tell me that I can't safely use and consume a plant in the privacy of my own home to help medicate me, to help relax me, to help make me happy? whatever it is i mean like if you're if you're cool with going and buying a bottle of jack it's illogical that you're you somehow like oh my god a, a joint is is a bridge too far it's it's literally absurd and a controlled one i mean you're talking about not getting it off the streets what about yeah, all exactly people, right what about all the people in prison what do we do with people who are outrageous outrageous and heartbreaking outrageous you know and, and also the legion of hundreds of thousands of people that have criminal records. You know, I created the first expedited pardons for marijuana charges in the history of Pennsylvania. Right now, that's the only way to get that off your record, you know, from that holding you up for the rest of your life. What I want is a legislative fix that says, you know what, boom, you know, it, it's all expunged, all of it. 
-hmm. and that's what we could do and that's and that's why we're we're that you know dawdling and i don't understand it i just don't and they're like well we've got more important things i'm like really then how come every all these other states are talking about it you know like what 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 does what does south dakota know about it that we don't what does new jersey know that we like for for not an important topic a, a hell of a lot of states seem to think it is a pretty important topic from virginia blue new right. jersey blue to maine blue to uh south dakota montana arizona you know right so you know let's just switch for a second and uh pennsylvania obviously as you know and you've been talking about played a, a lead role in our national elections what are some of the priorities mm -hmm that your administration would like to see addressed right away with, with the well, Biden? I, I would like to see more than anything that, and I think that's where, where the president-elect's going, is, is that, that the virus is the enemy and we need a unified strategy. And we need to be working together against that unified enemy, excuse me, that enemy and be unified. And that's COVID. I, you know, I, the, the COVID doesn't check. Well, are you a Republican or a Democrat? I, I only infect Democrats or I only infect Republicans. It's like, it's an equal opportunity infector. And we need to come to that understanding and, and address that. What I'd also like to see is help for cities and states because it's been, it's been a rough year. I don't care red or blue state. I don't care. Um, Oklahoma City or Philadelphia, it doesn't matter. It's been, it's been awful. Mm -hmm. And there's also been industries that have been decimated, like the restaurants and the bar and that through no fault of their own. It's just it was the virus, not the, you know, the, the thing that, that are going to help. And, and that's going to need to come at a federal level. And my hope is, is that we can begin this transition and stop arguing over who won, who lost. We know who did. And even they do. And just say, turn the page. And it's going to be a measured response less than what I would like if we don't take the Senate. And right now that's a tall order, quite frankly, electorally speaking. But what we can get is, is a <laughs> unified message coming out of the White House to say, you know what, let's stop arguing about masks and this other stuff and let's, let's kill this virus. Well, you know, we still have a lot of questions that people are still asking. And it's not just about COVID, but it's also asking about the questions about equity and access and disparity, particularly for innovators it, that want to get into the marijuana space, because there is some belief that, you know, how do people get access to building yeah. those companies and being entrepreneurs? I, 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 I want that. And I, I would just ask everybody that we need to first get to the place where we can have this conversation with, with our, counter, our Republican counterparts. And then that would be a priority. Like, I, I, I just, we can't let the perfect cannabis bill become the enemy of what we can get to the, to, to the floor of the House or the Senate. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's what I would just urge. It's like, I, I'm sure that I am simpatico with virtually all, if, if not all of those concerns. But that is also the nature of legislation here in, in Harrisburg. And right now it's been bludgeoning and beating away at this resistance. And it's never been more absurd, both ideologically, financially, and pragmatically to be a prohibitionist uh, on weed. And we're gonna keep pushing until we get to this common understanding that this is what Pennsylvania wants, it's what Pennsylvania needs, it's what people deserve, and whether it, whatever it is does for you, whether it's revenue, freedom, justice, you know, farm, you know, like whatever it is, there's something for everybody. So we, you know, we are concerned, obviously, at the tech, in the tech community, we're pro-business, we're pro-tech, we're pro innovation. As am I. And right, as are you. And so what does this mean for the upcoming year for the state of Pennsylvania, if we don't do anything about this? What does it mean for us? It, it means that it's like, get ready to pack up, pack up all of that and, and you know, send to New Jersey and then send it to Virginia, and then, you know, whatever. I mean, like, it's it's literally, it, it's it, it's punitively, it's just punitively dumb. I, I don't know how else to describe it. Like, you know, these, these conservative members typically represent rural districts with farmers. This is a cash crop. You know, 
veterans, like veterans is a bipartisan car. And like, I can't tell you how many veterans told me I need this, you know, like it's outrageous that I can't get this through the VA. Uh, you have revenue that could do whatever it is we decide to use. It's just like, again, saying yes to a plant or saying no to $5 billion in free money over the next two decades. It, 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 it's beyond a no brainer. So Jonathan, we're going to wrap up the show in a minute. And I know that you're running late. You probably landed in Harrisburg already. But Jonathan, you want to talk about, you want to ask him one last question? Outside. So John, I have seen you about 30 times, I think, walking down the Great Allegheny Passage as I'm riding my bicycle. I see you walking. I know you're <laughs> and you're trying to stay healthy, which I think is fantastic. I was going to actually stop my bike and say, would you please appear on BAU with us? But we didn't do that way because I didn't want to disturb you. But anyhow, tell us about the importance of parks and getting outside. Oh my gosh, fitness. our rail to trail system is is the finest in the country, or is certainly I, I'm not aware of a better one. And the the investments that they uh, the regionally have made, it's like you've got the Westmoreland Heritage Show, you got the Gap, you've got all of these amazing outdoor spaces that are uh, amazing. Frick Park, I mean, like oh my gosh, like. What kind of a regional and cultural, I, I think they're cultural assets, quite frankly. I don't, it, it, it's just like, there's something profoundly therapeutic about walking down the gap through all these different communities and seeing the leaves and seeing the, I mean, it's, it's amazing. Or in the Westmoreland Heritage Trail along Turtle Creek. I mean, just you name it, uh, whether it's on a bike or whether you're on, uh, you know, or you're two feet, you're jogging, you're whatever, you're walking your dog. It's, it's amazing. And uh, I, I, there is, there will never be a trail that I'm not for basically because it, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, these things, these things uh, are, are really at the core of, of making a better, more healthy and relaxed uh, society here mm -hmm. in both Southwestern Pennsylvania, but all across PA. Absolutely. So at, before, before you log off, tell us what are some final things that you want to tell us? I just want to tell, I would just want to leave everybody th this idea that um, I, I hope we can all kind of come together, whether you were rooting, no matter what team you're rooting for in this last election, we all need to come together. And that means we need to beat this virus down. We need to stop arguing about a face mask or going to a wedding with a hundred people indoors or these kind of other things. We need to just stop and say, you know what, legalizing marijuana would be a huge boon for Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, for our jobs, for our entrepreneurs, for just peace of mind. Like, like, uh, you know, like uh, I always ask law enforcement members, I said, which would you rather wrestle an angry drunk or an angry stoner? And they're like, well, I've actually never come across an angry stoner. You know, that's an easy one. And it's like, you know, uh, this idea that it's somehow a gateway drug is false. This idea that you have to love it or plan on using it. It's, it, it needs to join the basket of goods that you can get up and do in Pennsylvania, gamble at a casino, buy a lottery ticket, buy a can of, of Copenhagen, buy a carton of cigarettes, go to a state store and buy a bottle of gin. All mm -hmm. of that is legal. But if you get caught with a joint, you've got a criminal record for the rest of your life. And why would we want that for anybody? And... Uh, it just, these are some fundamental things that we can do to make Pennsylvania better that really just involve saying yes. And, and hopefully we can all come together. Um, we can disagree, but we can be more together than we've been. Well, John, you have been awesome. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for having such clarity in the vision and being so articulate and being a good representative of all great things in Pennsylvania, which you've done by your interview in Rolling Stone, to you and Giselle being in magazines, you're taking our brand with you and we really appreciate that. None of us here on the business side wanna see taxes raised. We wanna make Certainly sure- Certainly not we I. We can wanna to continue to build the tech and innovation that sits right at our footsteps, right next to all those parks. So, you know, remember that that's what everyone is trying to do each and every day and build a future for tomorrow whether you write code or whether you're someone who is a recipient of all those goods. So we're looking for equity, we're looking for prosperity and you know, the equality. So thank you for, for taking those, those rules and uh, embracing them and all that you do. 
and thank you for your good humor and all the and your allowing me to joke about the clothes that you wear and sure. whatever it is that you're wearing around your neck i think it's a it's a uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a gator yeah right. uh, you know you know gq called me an american taste god and i i couldn't agree more i am so yes yeah, so you can you okay. know, judge my That's, clothing all you want but uh, okay. I, I am an american taste god according okay, to gq whatever, so. if you want to <laughs> if you want to believe that <laughs> wow wow and ending on ending on a dig well okay now so but uh, uh but uh but no I, I thank you for having me on it's been a pleasure um thank you, you know, I, I have to go i i gotta go put the suit on for the man right now or they yeah. won't let me on the senate floor so thank you but again thank you uh, so you're much. all awesome and uh thank take you. care bye-bye be on the trail <laughs>